worship with the store. If you're streaming online or if you're visiting with us for the first time, my name is Aaron Kelso. I'm the lead planter and pastor of this community. And today we start a new series simply entitled The Messiah. It's a three-part study rooted in three Old Testament prophecies. Genesis 3.15 that we'll be focusing on today. Isaiah 7.14 we'll be looking at next week. And in two weeks we'll conclude the series with Isaiah 11.10. That specifically uh, promise a savior of divine proportion. Depending on which testament you find yourself in, this savior, this Messiah, will most commonly be referred to as the Messiah in the Old Testament, coming from the Hebrew word Mashiach. Fun word. It's fun to say once you learn how to say it. And in the New Testament, you'll find the Greek word Christos, which we tend to translate Christ. In other words, when we say Jesus Christ, we're saying Jesus the Messiah. They're the same thing. When we say Jesus Christ, we are saying Jesus the Messiah. <coughs> Contrary to popular, popular belief, Christ isn't Jesus' last name. But like a last name, it's an indicator of his origin and identity. The name or word Messiah is literally translated anointed one in reference to the setting apart of a ruler or king. From Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning to the end of Scripture, the Messiah is the overarching theme. Every writing either foreshadows or points directly to him. Every promise is said to be fulfilled in him. He is the hope of all people. Who as the prophet Daniel proclaimed will restrain transgression, put an end to sin, atone for wickedness, and bring in everlasting righteousness. He will abolish sin, sickness, and death. He will come with salvation in his right hand and restoration in his left. He will deliver mankind from sin. Bring them back to their creator and give them the life they were always meant to live. A life free of corruption with God and others in paradise, in perfect harmony forever. As Christians, we believe and revere Jesus as the Messiah all scripture points to. We believe Jesus, or Yeshua, a name which means Savior, Deliverer, and Rescuer, to be the Savior our God promised and our ancestors in the faith hoped for. Which is why, at Restore, we believe the Bible is to be viewed in a Christocentric perspective. Meaning that Christ, or Messiah, the Messiah, can and should be seen as the cornerstone and centerpiece that Jesus is at the heart of all that's contained in this holy book of faith. As Luke wrote after the resurrection, upon hearing two of his disciples debating the identity of the Messiah, asking them each other who they thought this Messiah was, if it was in fact their master Jesus or not, Jesus appeared and said these powerful words. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, meaning all that's in the Old Testament, that's what we view today. So beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted for the disciples the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. A Christocentric perspective is the way Jesus interpreted and taught those who followed him, going as far in the Gospel of John to say, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me, that you may have that life. For if you believed Moses, the author is associated with the first five books of the Old Testament, if you believed Moses, you would have believed in me. For Moses wrote of me. What this tells us is that the gospel the message of Jesus can be found as early as the book of Genesis. Within events that took place thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years before
before his birth in Bethlehem. With this perspective in mind, my hope is that through this series we would begin to see Jesus the Messiah in all the scriptures as God always intended. My overarching goal is not only to define the office of Messiah, but reveal Jesus to be the Messiah. Understanding who the Messiah is changes everything. Seeing him in the Old Testament attests to the fact that all scripture is connected, that God's always had a plan to restore us to himself, that Jesus has always been that plan in our Savior. Each week we'll discuss different things regarding uh, the Messiah, but today I want us to know that Jesus has always been the Christ. Amen? I want us to know that Jesus has always been the Christ. I want us to see Jesus in Genesis and understand what that really means. I've already referenced two examples of Jesus claiming that the writings of Moses revealed him to be the Messiah. What's incredible about this claim is that a reference to the Messiah can be found within the first promise given to the first couple. Within one of the first documented conversations in the Bible, there is a mention of a child among the offspring of Eve who would crush the head of Satan, sin, and death and bring life that would restore us to God in the midst of all this worldly corruption. It's a subtle, but powerful reference that can be easily missed. It's a promise placed in Genesis chapter 3 among a whole host of curses, kind of like a diamond in the rough. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and turn with me. If not, we'll have the words of the Scripture on the screen. I also wanted to reference real quick the fact that uh, under your seats I've placed a bunch of Bibles. Um, at the store, like, we want you to take those. Like, we always have them available. So, like, if you don't have a Bible, please take it. If you know somebody who doesn't have one and you want to give it to them, take it and give it to them. But those are for you. You can use them today. You can take them with you. They're yours. So, um, if you have a Bible with you, if you have one under your seat, you can go ahead and pull that out too. Uh, but look with me. If you would, at what it says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Moses transitions from this broad creation account in chapters 1 and 2 by turning specifically to one particular creature within that creation. It says this. Now the serpent was craftier than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Now the serpent was craftier than any other creature the Lord God had made. Although it's not explicitly clear who this serpent is initially, the New Testament, specifically in the words of Jesus, Paul, and John, all three men identify this serpent, this crafty, evil-intended creature, to be Satan. In the book of Revelation, the disciple John describes through a vision how at one point Satan was an angel who rebelled against God, was cast to the earth with his followers, and now has chosen to wage war against the offspring of the woman. That Satan has chosen because he knows he has already lost, that he's going to do everything he can to hinder that which God has created specifically he wants to go throughout the world and corrupt it and destroy it. We experience the effects of this war daily. What's sad is that we know no different. But this wasn't always the way. The Bible teaches in the first man, Adam, and woman, Eve lived in perfection in the presence of God. But with the introduction of sin, separation came. Separation that originated in the serpent's temptation of Eve that we're going to read about later. So Satan, having already been cast out, roaming around the earth, sees God's beautiful creation, and 
and wants nothing more than to corrupt it and destroy it. And so he appears to Eve in the form of an animal, a serpent. And he says to the woman, it says he said to the woman, picking up in verse 1, the latter part, did God actually say to you, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? I hear this all the time. And I believe that you do too. Satan is not that clever. Like he's crafty. Like he's craftier than the other animals, right? Like God's comparing it to animals. Like he's craftier, right, than the, the mindless beast over here, okay? He, so he is somewhat crafty, but he's not that original. Because he says the same thing to us. Over and over. God makes promises to us. God commands us to do things. And then what is his response? He's not denying whether or not God said it, because he can't deny that. We know that. Did God actually do that? And he places in these little seeds of doubt. And that's what he's doing to Eve here. Now what we're told in chapter 2 is that within this creation, within all the trees and all, all that's in the garden, God created two specific trees that were set apart. One called the tree of life, from which Adam and Eve were commanded to eat from, and one called the tree of knowledge of in good and evil. And it was the one rule God gave. Do not eat of that tree. So he gave them a choice. Right off the bat. Now some people are like, well, why would God put the tree in there in the first place? Well, because love doesn't exist without a choice. Relationship doesn't exist without a choice. There has to be a choice. Otherwise, we're just a, a mindless creation, a mindless robot following along with God is telling us we have to do. God wants more than that with you and me. He wants an actual relationship, and so with that comes a choice. And so God puts these trees there, and Satan takes advantage of this little loophole he's found. And he says, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. The serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. See, there, what Satan does is he mixes in truth with falsehood. Because they're not going to become like God, but they are about to understand what evil is. And what sin is. And so he plays on this. And he's like, oh, God didn't really say that. I mean, you're not actually going to like die this instant. I mean, maybe sometime down the road. God is just keeping things from you. He, he doesn't want you to be happy. He doesn't want you to have everything that you deserve. I mean, who, you, you run this show. You, you're in charge of this garden. And you're telling me that you can't eat of this tree? Go ahead. Then you'll be like God and have no need for him. That was the lie Satan believed. Where he ended up, and he's hoping that Adam and Eve end up in the same place. And so then we continue. Verse 6, And so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Now, part of me is like, come on now. Like, a lot of times we, we interpret it as like Eve is having this private conversation with Satan, and then she brings it to Adam. It's like, hey, try this. This is pretty good. And he just takes a bite. He's like, oh, no, that's from that tree? Like, no, no, he's literally there the whole time. And he doesn't say anything. Then the eyes of both were opened. And they knew that they were naked. What's this a sign of? It's a sign of innocence and purity. And all of a sudden, there's this shame that comes upon them because they had what was good and now they're experiencing what is evil. It says, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. There's a lot of better materials out there, but we have to understand that. 
That's what we do. We, <laughs> we just kind of throw something together and try to cover it up and do it our own way. Verse 8, we pick up. Says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Man, I mean, I could talk about this all day. Like, we do this exact same thing. We fall into sin. We fall into temptation. We end up doing something wrong. We try to fix it ourselves. Instead of running to God, we try to hide ourselves from Him because we don't think that we're worthy to be in His presence. Thankfully, we have a God who doesn't let us just stay in hiding, but He pursues us. This is, but the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? I love this because He's still making Adam come out to Him. Of course, He knows where He's at. And He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you gave to me, she gave me the fruit, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. my problem. That was somebody else's problem. God says, Adam, what did you do? Oh, well, it's her fault. Okay? What did you do? Oh, it's his fault. He just keeps, keeps going around, going around, going around. And then the Lord God says, said to the serpent. So he talked with Adam. He talked with Eve. Now he's going to Satan. Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts in the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat. All the days of your life. And there's the first curse. Which is why we have snakes, or why we view snakes as images of evil. Because that's the idea that Satan wasn't necessarily a snake in the, in, in the tree. If he, if he was already a snake, this wouldn't mean anything. Right? But he's some kind of legged serpent, whatever that is. And then all of a sudden, God's like, well, for that, I'm, I'm taking away your bearings. Instead of being up in this tree, you're going to be scooting along across the ground, eating dust until you end up back in the dust. Because that's where you're going to end up. By far, it gets the worst curse. And then still speaking to Satan, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your heel, and you shall bruise or he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is a three-tiered, three-part promise. The first part is between Satan and Eve. The second part is between Satan's offspring and Eve's offspring. And then the third part is between one particular individual and Satan. So we see first it's Satan, Eve, Satan's offsprings, are, oh, Jesus' offspring, God's offspring, Eve's offspring, offspring. Then you have Satan and the Messiah. What's interesting about this verse, it's translated different ways, but in most of your Christian Bibles, it'll use the word he. In Hebrew, that word is, 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 is a, in Hebrew, I guess the best way to describe it is like you're talking about like they or he or she. There's not a particular gender use for it, but it is a, a singular term. So it goes from a plural of talking about offspring and offspring to one particular offspring who will defeat Satan. The idea here, some of your translations say crush, some of them say bruise. The idea is that there's still going to be conflict. But the image that we're painted here is that this son, this particular offspring of Eve, is going to have his foot on the head of the serpent. The serpent is going to be biting. It's going to be fighting back the whole way down. But the worst he can do is bruise his heel. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a, a, a damaged heel or a damaged head. I think you'd rather have a damaged heel. Because that's the idea, is that it's bruising, it's pressing, it's squashing. It's not like a sudden crush. But it's going to end in a crush. So the idea is that this Messiah, this Messianic figure that is described here very vaguely, 
is going to come and sm smash, stomp out the serpent. Continue says to the woman, he said, I'm sorry, ladies, you will surely multiply your pain and childbirth. It's like, oh, could you imagine what it would be like to have kids that have to go childbirth? Like, I don't even know what that's like with all you mothers out there, and I'm sure it's like ice cream. Okay? It's gonna be wonderful. So, uh, but he says, for this reason, pain will come out of childbirth. He says, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. What's interesting is what we see in our culture today as well, constant conflict between genders. Not only is there conflict between the mother and the child, but there's conflict between the husband and the wife. Like everything that was supposed to be pure and beautiful and perfect is now corrupted because of sin. And, and, and to Adam he said, here you go fellas, because you listened to the voice of your wife and you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. Imagine, especially, I don't know if we have any farmers here. Imagine being a farmer and you didn't have to worry about any, like, using any pesticides, taking out any weeds or anything like that. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. So you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Verse 20. The man called his wife's name touch on this in a second. So after hearing all of this, it says Adam turned to Eve. Now it's interesting, we use the term Adam, like we give Adam a name, but he really doesn't have a name. He never gets a name. So you ladies, you should feel special because you're actually the first person who actually gets a name. Adam doesn't get a name. His name literally means dirt man. Man from the dirt. That is his name. Okay? Dirt man. Uh, um, that is his name. He's just a dirt creature. Like, that's because God formed the dust and created him out of that. Eve is just described as an extension of the dirt man. We can call her dirt woman. But she gets rid of that name, and Adam gives her a new name. Adam looks at his wife, and he calls her Eve, saying, because she is the mother of all that is living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothing. Now they're completely covered. What this also alludes to is the fact that something died to make those skins. A sacrifice was made by God that their shame may be covered. You know, who else did that for us? Right? But that's what God does here. It says, And then the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil, talking to himself in the Trinity. Now lest we reach out, now lest he reach out his hand and also take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord sent him out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he a cherubim, an angel, and a fiery sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. What's interesting about this is, and I've often wondered that as well, like why, like why is that necessary? The idea here is the fact that there was opportunity for Adam to, to take care of it himself. He could just go back to the tree and continue to live forever. But God didn't want that. verse that I want to talk about is out of enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and Eve's offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. At first glance, these words may seem cryptic to us. But looking at Adam's response in the rest of scripture, it's clear that this three-tier promise was understood to contain the first reference to the then mysterious Messiah. 
Upon hearing this promise and receiving judgment for his rebellion against God, Adam turns to his nameless wife and calls her Eve. And in Hebrew, that word means life giver. He calls her life giver. As we read, the man called his wife, called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Essentially, Adam is saying, he looks to her and says, you, from you, will come this child who will do this for us. You are the giver of life, the mother of all that is living. This comment kind of seems out of context for a lot of people when I was reading and studying on this. As if Moses is just kind of like throwing in a little side note or like a little fun fact. Why are you saying this? But that's not what this is. This simple utterance holds great significance because it sheds light on Adam's interpretation of what God said. God literally just told them that they had cursed and condemned themselves. Not only did he tell them that they would die, but that their lives would be filled with conflict and burden and pain. Horrible things are said here. That they're about to be separated from the presence of God, cast out of paradise for a piece of fruit. And yet Adam only responds with a word of hope. That's the only thing he says. He doesn't beg for forgiveness. He doesn't try to defend himself any longer. He doesn't place the blame on anybody else. He doesn't get wrapped up in his sorrow. He acknowledges his sin and due punishment and then chooses to cling to the promise of Eve. The Messiah, who would come from the woman to stomp out the serpent and all that he represents. I think the author of Hebrew describes this so perfectly. He wrote this next phrase I'm about to quote to you after describing a list of faithful people from the book of Genesis. He said, All these people died in faith, not having received the things promised to them, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. In other words, before the office or title Messiah was ever conceived, before the name Yeshua was ever spoken, Adam hoped for Jesus Christ and was satisfied. He believed the promised one of Eve would come with life in the midst of death. How amazing is it to see, Genesis, to see Jesus in Genesis and know he has always been the plan? How encouraging is it that even before mentioning the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin, God starts with a promise of a way out. Even after the curse, he makes a sacrifice and takes care of them by clothing them properly. He gives them hope covers their shame, and starts to reveal his plan of salvation and restoration. The second they fell, the very second they fell, he revealed a Savior and showed them he's already prepared for a way to live them back home. He graciously gives them a glimpse of Jesus. Praise be to God for his steadfast love and provision for this corrupted creation. Amen? Like Adam, and I'm sure Eve, we too need to receive this promise with hope. Hope meaning what hope is actually supposed to mean. Not hope as in a wish, but hope as in joyful expectation. We need to receive this promise with hope, with joyful expectation in the midst of sin, its consequences, and this broken world that we may be satisfied. Church, we have even more reason to hope. Do we not? We have even more reason to hope because the Messiah has come. Satan, sin, and death are already under his heel. His once for all sacrifice. 
Salvation is available through his resurrection. Restoration is already at work. The day is coming when death will die, when the grave will be no more, when Adam and Eve will return to paradise, but this time we get to return with them. It means God's always had a plan. It means his purposes will prevail. It means he loves us. It means he desires our freedom and union with him. It means relationship with God is possible. It means the enemy's control is still under God's control. It means Satan will be crushed and his, the curses he has brought will be eliminated. It means life will be given upon death. It means death will cease to exist. It means pain will be forgotten. It means sin will be forgiven. It means heaven is close at hand that will return to Eden as God always intended. It means everything. Does it not? It means everything. The fact that God would provide himself in the Messiah instead of condemning us or starting over with a new set of people what well, I would have done. Right, come on, we got two more. Like, oh, let's keep it going. Right? I would have just started over. You're only two people in. But it speaks to his indescribable compassion towards us. It's a scandalous love that's beyond our comprehension. It means he wants you. why God didn't start over. Because of those things right there. The reason the Messiah is at the center of all scripture is because nothing means more than his actual work. Being that we've already started to walk in My challenge is for us to continue in Adam's footsteps. Like Adam, we've all approached the tree of our own temptation, taken more than a bite of our own forbidden fruit, and denied the Lord in our sin. We're children of Adam, in need of the offspring of Eve, the one who will stomp out wickedness and death and replace them with righteousness. I mentioned before, upon recognition of his sin, hearing of his consequences, Adam's first response was to cling to the hope of the Messiah. When I say we need to continue in Adam's footsteps, I mean we need to do just that. We need to cling to the Messiah. We need to do the same. We need to cling to the hope of Jesus. Jesus is he who will bruise the head of the serpent. He's the Christ. He's my Messiah. He's your Messiah. He's the Messiah of all. Regardless of what we've done, or doing, or will do in opposition to
receive salvation, you'll begin this process of restoration. The world is broken. Sin has consequences. This life is filled with hardships and pain. Don't continue without it, lest you remain broken. Adam may have seen the Messiah from afar as some kind of distant shadow, but he kept Now he stands clearly in front of us as Jesus. So how much more shall we see? Follow Adam in pursuit of hope in Jesus, the Messiah. Church, Jesus has always been the Christ. He's always been your Messiah. He's always been your Messiah. My challenge for you this morning is to come to him with every care and concern, with everything that you are, and receive the hope that you have. Don't live another day, don't live another hour, don't live another second without this hope. You shouldn't just be. Just like Adam, we don't have a tree of life to go to in order to help us grow. There's a reason for this. It's that we rely on Messiah. He's the only one who can get us there. He's the only one that we need. sacrifices so much more than a couple animals in an altar. And that doesn't just cover that one sin for Adam and Eve. That one moment of shame. But his sacrifice covers all sin for all eternity. For all people. We have opportunity to come to Jesus. To not just hope in a shadow, but come to know so hard sometimes to know what people need, to know that you can't make them take it. But it's all around us. And I know there are those of you here today who have not given your lives to Christ, who aren't living in this hope, and it hurts me. Like I said, it's not some distant shadow. He's right here. He's waiting for you. What are you waiting for? What's holding you back? If it's anything in this world, I mean, come on, that's, that's nothing in comparison. It doesn't matter what you'll lose. It doesn't matter what you'll have to give up. It doesn't matter if you're not good enough. Because you're not. Neither am I. But it don't matter. Because of Jesus. Wow. God, as we reflect upon this ancient story, as we reflect upon Adam and Eve, as we talk about the first promise, the first promise of the Messiah, the first mention This small reference is powerful. We thank you for your provision and for your blessing for us. That even though we are separated, even though we've been cast from the garden, you desire to have us back and are preparing a way for us to return to you. God, you've given us a shepherd to lead us back.
thank you that your purposes are being accomplished.